need to unmute myself. Um, thanks very much, Bill. Um, thanks for the introduction, Dom. Um, really delighted to be with you all and, um, and to share some of our uh, experience, um, particularly with regard to small scale DAB. Um, I've uh, got a PowerPoint presentation. Um, Bill, I presume I can screen share that. Um, I'll get you set up for that. Um, um, so I'll flip over to that, if I may. So can you all see that? That's in vision, Steve. How's that? Is that all right? Yes, good. Okay, okay. Um, so look, I, I want to cover well, two things really here today to talk to you about small scale DAB, um, sustainability and funding models, and to tell you more about Chefcast Digital as a, as a case story. Um, just by way of background, um, those of you that don't know me, um, yes, I have long-standing associations with the CMA, um, being one of its uh, founders back in the very early days and having had the privilege of being chief executive of the association for several years. Um, I run a social enterprise and community media support organization called Community Media Solutions. Um, I also chair the board of our local community radio and local TV channels, which, uh, which operate under the brand Sheffield Live. And we recently, last year, set up uh, a new company called Shepcast Digital, um, which was uh, one of the first uh, small-scale DAB licenses to be awarded and, and, and the first to be awarded in the competitive process. And, and I hope to share a bit more about that um, later on in this presentation. Um, I want to just um, start by covering a number of issues. Um, First of all, just to, just to think a little bit widely about what sustainability means, um, including looking at ownership models and uh, the concept of community DAB, which, which I would really love to get your feedback on. Um, then I'll go into a little bit more detail on business models, and then we'll come to Chefcast Digital. Um, so first of all, um, people often think of sustainability as, as being about economic and, and uh, sustainability. And, and certainly when you run out of cash, um, that is, uh, that's the most obvious moment at which um, you recognize that, that things are not sustainable. Um, but in practice, um, sustainability in community broadcasting, as in many other sectors, has, has many different facets. And amongst the important ones, I would say, are the overall governance and ownership arrangements that you have in place. Um, social sustainability, by which I mean the support of your wider community, your mechanisms for participation and accountability. Um, this is often the most important mechanism for sustainability in community broadcasting. When things do go awry, if the community really wants you to keep going, um, they, people will rally around and, and generally find ways in which, which you can keep going. And I think it's, it's admirable and should be recognized more widely that community radio organizations and other community media groups have proven a lot more resilient than the mainstream commercial uh, media organizations. Then there's the challenge of technical sustainability. And we all know those of us that have been involved in running community radio stations, how important it is to have um, uh, robust technical solutions and people that understand the technical side. Um, economic sustainability, we're going to talk more about business models in a moment, um, and that's, that's what people often think of when they talk about sustainability. Um, and finally, we all need to think more about environmental sustainability and how we're going to create um, zero carbon community media in the future. So let me go on to ownership models, because I think this is fundamentally important. And what we've seen in the small scale DAB sector, um, as it's emerged, is a number of different models. Um, we've, seen, uh, we've seen some applications that are, that are single licenses for one area that are not bidding into other areas that are under some form of community ownership um, or participation in the project by, by community media projects. Um, this might be a, a local community radio licensee that, that is the owner of the uh, small scale DAB multiplex. It might be a local consortium of uh, uh, of uh, potential content providers, community digital sound program service providers, or it might be some other form of community-based ownership. Then we've seen a number of companies that have set themselves up as multiple license 
uh, MUX license operators. Um, you'll have heard, I'm sure, of uh, Niocast, Nation, um, uh, amongst others, that are essentially commercial platform providers. Um, uh, perhaps there could be a non-profit MUX operating company in the future that might operate on that basis as well. Um, but that, that would remain, I think, a very different model from, from community ownership. And finally, there are, there are also some hybrid ownership models emerging where there's local participation, but there's external equity and there's a tension there between local ownership and, and ownership from those that have invested finance. Um, a, a bottom line principle for community media and, and for social enterprise and cooperatives generally um, is that it is that the community uh, that in which the services provided should have the ultimate ownership and should hire funding in to enable that possible, enable that to be possible. Uh, it shouldn't be the, the finance that's kind of hiring the community, but the other way around. So I want to sort of set out some principles of, of what I call community DAB. We could think of this as being the next generation of community media. Um, what, do we, what might we mean by community DAB? Um, these, I think, are some of the core principles that, that we should consider. First, that, that these are social enterprises under local ownership. Um, secondly, they're operating for community benefit. Third, that they need to be delivering resilient small-scale DAB infrastructure. Fourth, they need to be assuring there's affordable cost for community radio. Fifth, as local social enterprises, they should give priority to community digital sound program services and to local digital sound program services. And finally, they should be non-profit making. If they make any surplus, it should go back into either maintaining and developing the business, reducing the costs for community radio, or supporting community media development more widely. Um, so I'd, I'd like to sort of get, come back to that at the end and, and really get some feedback on, on those principles uh, uh, as a uh, as a sort of vision for, the, for a community DAB sector that, that hopefully will emerge uh, as, as part of this new small scale DAB landscape. Now I want to move on to business models and I'm going to look at three areas, capital expenditure, operating expenditure and, and, and revenue models and I'll talk a little bit about sources of finance as well. Um, so first of all, capital expenditure, there are significant costs in planning and design, including making a license application, um, potentially uh, co high costs of uh, setting up the design for the build out of your transmission system and antennas and so on. Then there's equipment and software to purchase. There are installation costs for, for putting the equipment in place. There are network installation costs, both for the contribution networks from the uh, content providers to the multiplex and the distribution network from the multiplex to the transmitter or the transmitters, transmitters plural. Then there are license application fees, as well, uh, uh, as, well as pre start operating costs, uh, including people's time involved in the project. The level of operating expenditure we need to think about and provide for transmission site costs, including rentals, rates, electricity, um, network charges uh, for the contribution and the distribution networks, uh, cost of the multiplex system, which might be, might be run in house or it might be a cloud-based uh, service provider. Um, MUX partnership management, um, assuming that there are different partners involved in the project, Ofcom licenses, and potentially financing costs if you are uh, relying on repayable finance. So a couple of scenarios um, in terms of um, capital and operational uh, operating expenditure. Um, this one assumes that there's a single multiplex on, an, on a single site um, and that one transmission site is sufficient to cover the whole of the locality. Um, typical estimates, a bit over 20,000 in terms of capital costs, um, the main part of that being the transmission system and perhaps a similar amount in terms of operating costs, the main part of that being uh, people time involved in in managing the multiplex, including technical management of it, swapping channels in and out, monitoring it and so on, um, and uh, invoicing and, and credit control. Neither of those are really a full-time job. Um, if something like this is working well and you've got loyal customers, um, then, then less time will be involved. If you've got a lot of swapping in and swapping out, then it's gonna be a little bit more time consuming. 
So scenario two assumes that you have a network with two transmitters. Um, uh, in many cases, there might be three or even four um, more than that. I haven't seen many examples of, of more than four in the license applications that have succeeded so far. Um, I think uh, in, to cover some uh, more widespread rural areas, we, we may see more transmitters again. Um, but the, the basic principle for small scale DAB is that you can have as many transmitters as you need. They all operate on one frequency um, using a single frequency network. So you're only using up one frequency um, and you can just place them judiciously um, according to your needs to cover the population that you're seeking to reach. Um, but clearly um, two transmitters is likely to cost um, twice as much as one. Um, and there are some additional costs when you have a single frequency network also of ensuring that everything is uh, uh, synchronized, um, including having um, GPS receivers on, on, on each site so that you can uh, time, time sync them. Um, then the operating, uh, uh, the, uh, the operating costs um, don't go up very significantly. They basically will be the transmission site costs. The, the management costs are probably not going to go up all that much more. Um, there might be some additional maintenance costs for the transmission system as well. So those are sort of fairly typical costs for a, a two-site system. Um, there are lower cost ways of doing this. So if you end up having to look at multiple sites, then you may want to look at lower cost transmission systems that might be a little less uh, robust. Um, and, I, and I say that because there's, uh, th these assumptions that I have here assume uh, professionally built broadcast um, DAB transmitters. Um, but as I think is quite well known now, you can, um, you can, build, um, uh, you can build DAB transmitters using um, uh, software-based technologies on a, on, a, on, a, on a small Linux box. Um, and that can be much, much cheaper than, than these costs. So if you have the know-how to go down that low cost route, um, there may be reliability problems. You're less likely to have a, a warranty in place and things like that, um, but potentially you could significantly reduce the costs of, of building the transmission system. Um, you're probably still gonna need some professionally built um, raw, um, radio uh, RF amplifier to add into the mix, um, but, but the basic, um, modulator and, and the other parts of the transmission chain um, can be built on open source technologies now. And that's one of the reasons that small scale DAB uh, has looked much more viable than, than it did in the past. Um, so just moving on to revenue models, um, there are a number of different approaches to this. And uh, really the, you know, the channel operator needs to decide which, which approach it wants to take, um, whether it's simply going to a charge the administrative costs, uh, whether it's going to set a fixed fee, whether it's going to have a variable fee that is based on market pricing, what they can you know, extract from the customers, or some hybrid of, of those uh, three things. Uh, in practice, we have to think about uh, the rules on fair and effective competition, which are embedded into the small scale DAB uh, uh, order and regulations. Um, so whichever mechanism is, is used, um, there has to be a demonstration that is being done on a fair basis um, and that no one is being unfairly disadvantaged. Um, there might well be charges for additional services in addition to the, to the charges to the channels um, to be on the multiplex. But in most cases, the main part of the business model is charging uh, channels for the, for the access to channel capacity. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you when we come to the case story of Chefcast, uh, the, the kind of rate cards that we've developed um, with that in mind. Um, additional services, you know, they might be kind of services that you provide to some of the content providers. You, for example, you might host their playout system um, or provide them with some, you know, playout support. Uh, you might host a studio for them if they're locally based. So you know, building-based community media organizations might think about adding in extra studios and, uh, and, and hiring studio space to, to other local or community radio stations that want to be on their multiplex. Those are just a couple of examples. So how much might you get per channel? Um, we've, we've some evidence from, from Ofcom's survey. It's, it's a few years old now, but Ofcom did a survey of the small-scale DAB trials um, in which... Um, it, it was indicated that the most common charging level was between 200 and 500 a month. Um, some were charging a good bit less than that. Um, 
but that range, 200 to 500 a month, um, is, the, uh, is, is the most common level of funding. And that seems to reflect our experience of talking to content providers as well. Um, so that you can probably think in those sorts of terms, but it depends very much on the population coverage, how attractive the area is to, to particularly to commercial digital sound program, DSP providers that might want to purchase space on your multiplex. Um, if you're a you know, major city, it, you're probably going to have a premium. Um, if you're uh, uh, a small town, if you're covering a number of small towns or a rural area, it might be more difficult to command higher prices. Um, to some extent, pricing is going to relate to the population coverage, but not exactly. Um, it, I, I think even, even with similar population coverage, um, major well-known cities are likely to have a premium over, over less well-known locations. Um, in some parts of the, of, of the country, we may see um, you know, regional approaches with people wanting to cover a region by being on a number of small-scale DAB multiplexes as well. And that, that's probably good news for, for some of the muxes that are, that are inter, interstitial to uh, existing major cities. Um, but that gives us a sense overall of what the pricing might look like. Um, where do we get startup funding from? A um, number of different models to look at. Um, grant funding, there's still some of it out there. It's pretty competitive. Um, social investment loans, a lot easier. Um, it's, it's more of a borrower's market. Um, there's a lot of different agencies, about 30 different agencies that are running social investment loan schemes. Um, some projects have been successful with um, uh, by issuing um, shares to their supporters or, or taking loans from their supporters or, or other types of crowdfunding. Uh, it may be possible to uh, to reduce the startup costs by engaging in a higher purchase arrangement with a transmission uh, equipment provider or purchasing transmission as a service rather than as an upfront um, capital cost. Some sources of grant funding, probably you're familiar with some of these, at least probably the first places to look at, um, the National Lottery Community Fund, Arts Council, Power to Change. Um, Access Foundation is probably a little bit less well known um, but they have quite an important fund if you're going for uh, repayable finance. Uh, so if you're considering a social investment loan, um, you can apply to the Access Foundation for up to £16,000 to help get your business plan ready and to, be, to become uh, investment ready, if you like. Um, so that's, that's a fund I think is still open at the moment, probably not for more than another year or so. Um, as I say, there's a number of social investment lenders out there. Um, one of the biggest is Key Fund. They're based in Sheffield. They lend across uh, north of England and the Midlands. Um, social investment business um, it operates UK-wide. They, they have a number of different funds. Cooperative and community finance um, operates across uh, England and Wales. Um, very good, friendly lender to community businesses. Um, so those are just a few examples. There's a lot more out there and, and I can signpost people to relevant ones if you, if you want to get in touch with me later. Um, so if I can, I'll move on now to, let's see how the time's going. I'll move on to Chefcast and to tell you a bit more about our real world experience. I, I've been doing presentations a bit like this at several CMA conferences over the last uh, two or three years, Bill might remind me when I did the first of these, um, setting out business models and for small scale DAB. And it's all been uh, somewhat theoretical, but, but drawing on what we knew from the, from the trial services. Um, so, so last year we had the opportunity in Sheffield to actually apply for a small scale DAB license um, to set out our proposition um, and for Ofcom to, to assess that and, and to decide on our, on our license application. Um, and you know, I'm delighted to say that we were successful. It was a competitive um, process. So there were two other bidders uh, for the Sheffield and Rotherham small-scale DAB service, um, um, but our proposal um, was successful and, and we had news of the license award uh, about three months ago. Um, so how did this come together? Well, first of all, just a bit of background and context. Um, we've been running community radio and other community media initiatives in Sheffield for a bit over 20 years now. Um, back when I was chief executive of the CMA, um, we helped to nurture into existence uh, a 
local community radio project, having endeavoured to support a number of local initiatives um, and being in the situation of running some training courses for, for people in radio production skills. Out of that came a, uh, a two-day restricted service license broadcast for a community festival um, 21 years ago, um, from which arose a, a more uh, sustained effort to build community media in Sheffield. Um, 20 years ago, it was rebranded as Sheffield Live, um, and it was broadcasting several RSLs a year um, and operating on the internet. Um, in 2007, it launched as one of the first uh, full-time licensed FM community radio services, um, Sheffield Live 93.2 FM. Um, uh, seven years after that, in 2014, um, having set up a new um, sister company, um, we were able to acquire the local TV license to operate that on a, on a not-for-profit basis and under the same Sheffield Live brand. So Sheffield Live TV launched in, in, uh, in September uh, 2014. Um, and when we set up Sheffield Live TV, we set up a, a holding company, which was also an investment vehicle called Sheffield Community Media a community benefit society which raised funds through a community shares issue um, and in the course of its uh, campaign to, to raise investment and to get started um, it raised uh, 120,000 from the community in, in community shares and it matched that up with a further, uh, further 100,000 in finance from social investment loan funders so over 200,000 of startup capital to get a community television on the air. So today in Sheffield, we have Sheffield Live uh, Community Radio, Sheffield Live TV, um, website sheffieldlive.org, which has um, a daily news blog on it that's, that comes from the video journalists that work on the TV channel. So, it's, so effectively, it's also a, 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 a web-based um, community news product. Um, and. Um, it, when we heard about the small scale DAB opportunity, we, we obviously thought, well, you know, this is potentially another, uh, another way in which we can diversify community media in Sheffield um, and continue our ambition to ensure that there is a community media presence on every possible communications platform. Um, so Sheffield Community Media, the Community Benefit Society, um, set, sent in uh, an expression of interest to Ofcom, I guess this would have been about three years ago when Ofcom hold, held its first round of expressions of interest in small scale D DAB. Um, and we continued to lobby subsequently um, with the result that when the first round of small scale DAB licenses were announced, um, Sheffield was one of the first 25 areas. Um, that announcement was in April last year. And um, of course, we'd all just gone into lockdown and we were hugely focused on COVID response, putting out um, uh, public health messages on, on community radio and local TV, endeavouring to keep our news operation going in a small bubble in the TV studios and to, to keep people informed, working in partnership with local festivals that had all had to flip from a real world environment to digital forms of delivery um, and the television and the radio platforms were an important part of helping them to reach their audiences. So we were massively busy, busy and distracted by, by entirely different things when, when Ofcom, uh, first of all, set out the, the areas for round one and then subsequently um, confirmed that they were going to um, go ahead with, um, with pushing forward on the licensing process from September 2020. Nevertheless, um, from, from June last year, we, we began some, some groundwork and, and partnership building for a community-based approach to the small-scale DAB license in Sheffield. Um, we contacted our, our, our fellow community radio operators in, in uh, Sheffield and Rotherham, Link FM, which is, which is run by the Pakistani Muslim Centre. It's, mainly, it's a mainly Asian community-focused community radio channel. Uh, and uh, Red Road FM, which is a mainly youth-focused uh, community radio station in South Rotherham. And we invited them to, to join us and to form a partnership of all of uh, Sheffield and Rotherham's community radio stations together with Sheffield Community Media as the investment vehicle to drive the project forward. 
Um, we were really pleased that people did come together in Sheffield and Rotherham and that we were able to, to form initially a working group uh, and then later to register a new company called Sheffcast Digital Limited, um, which uh, has, has been the uh, licensed applicant. And uh, we, we put our license application in in November by the deadline. And as I say, we were awarded the license at the end of March. So I'm just going to take you through a little bit more about the, the business model. One of the first things we did at an early stage, once we've got the company registered, is uh, we put a website up um, so that we were you know, really open and transparent about what we were doing. Um, there was an application form where people could express their interest in being involved or providing uh, content services to be on the multiplex. Um, uh, we, we, we used the branding, join us on a new broadcasting adventure. Um, and uh, we were really pleased with the response that we got from that. Um, we engaged in local consultation with key stakeholders. We started talking to, to potential funders, but most importantly, we spent a lot of time talking to potential customers. Um, both uh, community-based providers and, uh, and commercial digital sound program service providers. We researched everybody that was anybody that was doing any kind of internet radio station in Sheffield or Rotherham. And we, I still think we may have missed one or two, but, they, but they'll probably be on board soon. Um, and we, we got in contact with them, started a conversation about you know, whether they would be interested, what sort of support they would need, uh, what they, what, price they might be able to afford um, and then we did the same thing with with customers from outside of Sheffield and Rotherham um, organizations first of all we looked at who was on the trial muxes uh, the trial small-scale DAB muxes um, we looked at we, we talked to some of the mux operators uh, to, to see who were the reliable customers um, we looked at what would be a good mix and we developed a long list of potential uh, clients that we that we decided to approach. Uh, we arranged a number of phone conversations, um, talking to them again about pricing, about their interest in being on, on a small scale DAB multiplex in Sheffield and so on. Um, and after all those conversations, we had a much better idea of what people would be prepared to afford. Um, we designed a rate card um, and, and we, we put it out there. Again, we, we sought feedback on it. And once we felt that, that the potential customers were happy with it and we got a sufficient number on board for the license application and to make the project sustainable. Um, we then put that rate card out with heads of terms agreement um, and asked people to sign up to it. So Chefcast Digital is a community led consortium. And so it's a joint initiative between Sheffield Community Media, uh, Comedia Sheffield, which is the company that runs Sheffield Live 93.2 FM Pakistan Muslim Centre, which runs Link FM and Red Road FM in, in South Rotherham at Kiverton Park. It's established as a new not-for-profit social enterprise. Um, it's, the legal structure is based broadly on a community interest company structure, although it's not technically a community interest company. We didn't see a need for that as it's uh, in itself. It's, uh, it's majority owned by Sheffield Community Media Limited, which is a community benefit society. So... The board is structured like this. Sheffield Community Media Limited has majority control and can nominate up to four directors. Um, and it has four out of seven votes in a general meeting. Each of the community radio stations nominates one member to the board. Um, the, the four nominated by Sheffield Community Media are selected so that we have a good mix of expertise, uh, experience, know-how and backgrounds on the board alongside the, the community radio representatives. Um, this is the rate card we, we produced after extensive consultations with potential customers. Um, we split it into two tiers, one for digital sound program uh, providers, that is commercial uh, DSPs, and, and one for community DSPs um, with, with a significant differential in the rates. Um, uh, the, we also split the rate card up into what we call bronze, silver, and gold packages, um, gold being, uh, full broadcast quality in stereo at 48 kilobits per second, silver being a little bit less um, bandwidth at 40 kilobits per second, and, and bronze being more appropriate for talk-based channels or those that are broadcasting music in mono at 32 kilobits per second. Um, and we did a similar structure for the CDSP rates. Um, so we attach that to 
uh, a simple heads of agreement, one page um, setting out um, our commitments to, to these prices, at least for the first year, um, and, and, and getting the customers to sign up to confirm that they either held a DSP license or a CDSP license, or they intended to do so, so that they would be licensed to be carried in Sheffield and Rotherham. Um, be, up to the date of the license application, we recruited 21 uh, what we called pioneer partners. Um, we agreed with all of them the same pioneer partner discount on the rates, so they, they'll all get a little bit cheaper rate than, than anyone that comes next. They, these are all the groups that signed up um, and were included in the, in the license application uh, as having signed heads of agreement. Um, uh, you'll see that, um, uh, that uh, 11 of them are community digital sound program service providers and, and 10 of them are simple DSPs. Um, so, so one of the real benefits, I think, of, of a community approach to DAB is that we prioritize carrying community services. Um, in most other locations where the, where the providers are commercial, um, they seem to be carrying the minimum number of community services rather than a maximum. Um, and Ofcom has set a minimum level. In Sheffield, they set a minimum of seven, but um, our, our expectation is to carry uh, at least 11, um, according to our current plans. And, and I don't think you'd see that, you'd be likely to see that level of prioritization to community services um, uh, amongst the more commercially focused um, uh, multiple MUX operators that are out there. Um, so this is our technical plan, and we were really determined to, to ensure that the service covered Sheffield and Rotherham, um, and you'll see here that um, we've overlaid on this map um, the local authority boundaries of Sheffield and Rotherham, and the Ofcom polygon, and the Ofcom polygon is described as Sheffield and Rotherham. Um, it does cover most of Sheffield, but it covers less than half of Rotherham, um, which um, you know, which we, which we thought was a little strange. And, and, and we suspect that the polygon planning hasn't taken much account of actual local authority boundaries, um, which, which for many people are, you know, part of a, you know, coherent editorially defined area um, because of the extent to which local authorities influence news and so on. Um, so, um, you know, we, we arranged a, a two site transmission system with, with one site somewhat to the west of Sheffield city centre and the other site somewhat to the east of uh, Rotherham town centre, uh, with the effect that this enabled us to spill over into South Rotherham um, to cover a good part of the, to overlap in a, in, to a good extent with the coverage of Red Road FM, which is outside of the polygon, but it's not in anybody else's polygon either. So we were really keen to have them on board and to be able to reach into their um, part of Rotherham. Um, and so you'll see that's kind of, it's quite a carefully designed um, coverage plan from two very prominent sites um, in West Sheffield and, 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 uh, and, and east of Rotherham town centre. Um, to get those two sites, we had to engage with, uh, with two multinationals, um, commercial companies that run transmit transmitter sites that you probably have heard of. Um, Arkiva um, owns one of the sites and Selnex owns the other as a result of a, a deal last summer when Archiva sold nearly all of its non-broadcast sites to Selnex. Um, so we've had a lot of back and forth over nine months now with Archiva and Selnex um, to, to firm up details. Um, but we believe we're coming through with a really quite a smart deal um, where, where, where we're meeting the upfront costs of being on the site, um, but we are paying a very simple site share rental only, which um, in, on both sites is, is, is per site is less than £3,000 per annum. Um, so um, that those costs um, mean that although these are very dominant sites, they're, they're nevertheless affordable over the long term. Um, and that's a result of uh, us doing most of our own build out on the sites and, and investing upfront with the two companies where we need their design input or, or their uh, riggers on the tower and so on. Um, so, so this is our business model. Um, we've got you know, capital costs consisting of transmission equipment, multiplexer, network installation, estimated capital requirements of about 60,000, including provisions for working capital. Um, expect this to be met by a mixture of grants, social investment loans, community shares and community bonds. Um, we've, we've got more than enough funding in place. Um, uh, we've got promises in the region 
of about 120,000 actually. So we're, we're kind of in the fairly luxurious position of, of deciding which parts of that to draw down or, or whether to, to, to take on some other possibilities. Uh, for obvious reasons, we're trying to maximize the grant contribution to the mix um, and to minimize the amount of repayable finance. Um, but, uh, but, the, but the final structure is still, uh, still is being worked through as we, as we work towards the launch of the service. Um, the operating side, transmission site rental, circuit cost, maintenance management, um, we're op estimating our operating cost to be around about 35 to 40 K. Um, in the first, uh, first year and a half, it'll be somewhat lower than that because it's being cross subsidized by the existing um, uh, community media organization. So we're, we're, we're using existing staff time um, that, that's already uh, costed in um, to support some of the technical aspects of it. Um, we already have a, a technical manager who works full time with the with the um, with Sheffield Live TV, so that gives us a, a good springboard to work from. Um, but going forward, we expect operating costs to be in that region, um, and we estimate now on the basis of the heads of agreement that are, that are in place that we will uh, be able to uh, um, reach at least ninety percent occupancy of the DAB multiplex at any one time, and that that should generate about sixty thousand a year. Um, since we put the license application in, we've been approached by a lot of other potential customers. So we not only have 21 heads of agreement in place, we've got a list of about 12, 15 that, uh, that are kind of in a waiting list. Um, and we're going to have another open call shortly um, in which we'll receive applications and we'll select the ones that, that, that we think are going to be uh, most likely to sustain themselves and to add diversity to the mix of services available. So these are some contacts for further information. I'm you know, very happy to, to take questions after this meeting um, and, and provide more detailed background. Um, since we completed this license application, um, we have been working with a number of other groups across the country, um, providing support for them, um, you know, sharing our more detailed business modeling and templates and so on. Um, and I'm also working with, with Bill at the CMA um, on what we hope will be a, a kind of handbook for community DAB in the future. So your feedback on these sorts of presentations is to, is to, to us uh, invaluable as we continue to develop conceptually a, a sustainable model for community DAB. So that's all for me for now. Happy to take questions. Thanks.